Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Tristan Claridge and I'm the convener of the Social Capital Research Group. Um, our group promotes and, and the advancement of social capital theories and, and we support anyone who wants to use the concept in research and practical applications. Uh, we have members from about 130 different countries. We have an active uh, discussion group with about a thousand members and we hold regular webinars from invited speakers. So in this session, we welcome Professor Carl Bankston uh, for a presentation and discussion about in what sense is social capital capital? Carl is Professor of Sociology at Tulane University. His most recent books include American Ideas of Equality, A Social History from 1750 to 2020, The Rise of the New Second Generation, and Immigrant Networks and Social Capital. His research interests include international migration, sociology of education, stratification, historical sociology, and sociology of religion. And social, social capital theory has consistently been a dominant framework um, across all of these areas of his research. So welcome, Carl. Thank you. Th uh, thank you for inviting me, Tristan. And um, thanks to all the participants and also um, my thank yous to the people who had sent a few questions uh, ahead of time. I I'm not sure that I had adequate responses or good answers for the questions that were asked, but they, they were thought provoking and they did lead me to at least think about the things that I was uh, unable to adequately address. Um, I, I had thought that I might start by talking a little bit about how I came to social capital theory, um, which might tell us something about my thoughts on this topic, but also about my limitations and um, how I might be wearing blinders about some aspects of social capital or, or how it's used. Um, I, I began to come to this topic because of my work in looking at Vietnamese adaptation to, to life in the United States. Um, prior to entering academic work, I worked for uh, about five years in a refugee camp in the Philippines, sending Vietnamese, Laotian, and Cambodian refugees and people from those countries, uh, preparing them for resettlement in the United States. Um, and on returning to the US, one of my interests was trying to understand what I had been doing and um, the consequences of the programs that I had been participating in. Um, and so I wanted to look at how it was that the largest group of Southeast Asian refugees, Vietnamese, were adapting to life in the United States. Uh, and, and I decided that it was particularly important to look at young people, because these were the folks who were growing up uh, as Americans. And um, so how they would fit in seemed to me especially important. Uh, and so in, in looking at how I would account for Vietnamese adaptation to life in the United States, the role of community in enabling individual adaptation and mobility became especially clear. Uh, and I came to see that interpersonal relationships uh, functioning at levels of family, community, and formal organizations were critical in shaping how young people fit into the United States, that their own ethnic communities were essential forms of guidance and social support for um, addressing the challenges of life in the United States. Um, and I developed this, um, this term ethnicity as social capital um, with the idea that social relationships were based on common ethnicity and that common ethnicity was uh, an essential part of how people adapted. Um, and the study of Vietnamese adaptation, since I was looking especially at young people, 
led me to schools and to the sociology of education. Um, I saw Vietnamese students bringing social assets from their neighborhoods to their schools. And the assets that, that I saw um, could be characterized as support and direction, which I understood in terms of the ways that James S. Coleman had talked about uh, in his work on social capital as um, families and institutions together providing structures of social relations that, um, that guided the lives of young people. Um, and the assets that young people brought from their homes, I found could be invested in each other in schools. That schools, you might say, were marketplaces for the investment of social capital. That young people derived support and direction from their families, from their communities. They brought these assets with them to schools, normative assets, but also um, patterns of behavior, and they invested those in each other. Uh, and the same kind of dynamics, the same kind of dynamics could be The same kind of dynamics could be extended to students from other backgrounds. Uh, influenced by James Coleman's work um, in, in terms of social capital theory, some of the, the big influences on me, of course, James Coleman, but also Alejandro Portes. Uh, Portes was the mentor of someone that I worked with very closely, that is Min Jo. Um, but heavily influenced by Coleman's work, I saw socioeconomic status as a source of social capital, um, a source of social capital, both normatively, but also in the patterns of relationships that existed in, in homes. And logically and empirically, family relations associated with SES, such as habits, orientation toward educational advancement skills could be seen as assets that students bring to schools from families. Uh, and in schools, students invested these assets uh, in each other. Um, empirically, what a co-author and I found is we look at looked at determinants of scores on standardized tests, that some of the biggest determinants were the people that, the, the students that students went to school with, and that socioeconomic status was a big influence on how well students did in school, and not just students' own socioeconomic background, but also the socioeconomic background of those who were in the school with them, but the school socioeconomic background. Uh, we use multi-level modeling to look at uh, nested models of, of influences. Um, and my interpretation of this, based also not simply on statistical work, but also on some field work in the schools, was that what was happening was that students were developing expectations about future education, um, habits of study, um, ideas about delayed gratification, and bringing these ideas to school where they would invest these uh, assets, these social assets, in each other. So the social setting of the school derived from what students were bringing from outside the schools. Now, I think there are some 
limitations to this background uh, for the study of social capital. And, and you might think about that and think about where it is that um, I'm not, I, I have not been able to adequately deal with all aspects of social capital. Um, first of all, my work focused primarily on relatively small groups and lower level institutions like schools and communities. Um, and some of the really important considerations of social capital theory deal with social capital at the state and societal level, like Robert Putnam's work. Um, and I'm not sure about the extent to which one could extrapolate from these small group settings to say national social capital or engagement at the state level. Um, and also, and I'll deal with this a little bit later. Um, this is maybe a, a limitation, but also uh, an idea that I have about what social science consists of. My work was heavily descriptive and explanatory rather than prescriptive. Um, in other words, I was concerned with how social capital theory explains outcomes in groups of people rather than primarily with coming up with uh, policy prescriptions. Um, and I, I think very often coming up with policy prescriptions or with recommendations is um, one of the areas in which um, I've found the greatest challenge and the greatest difficulty. Um, one, one reviewer of a book that I, I, I co-wrote years ago remarked on the book that um, these guys, referring to us, the authors, spend 200 pages talking about the issue and then they spend 15 pages talking about solutions and their solutions aren't very good. And I thought the, 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 uh, the reviewer was actually right, that, that we didn't really come up with very good solutions. Uh, I'm not sure that it, it's always the job of a social scientist to come up with solutions. And you know, I also think, and we'll look at this a little bit later, that sometimes when, when social scientists do come up with solutions, these have the, the character of snake oil that, you know, they tend to be um, selling panacea for uh, problems that are difficult to solve. Okay, uh, I see we have a chat here. Uh, oh, okay. We've got Marion monitoring the chat, so we'll she'll help us to, to identify any questions that might come up. Um, if you want, we can handle them through the session or we can wait till the end. Uh, whatever people prefer. I mean, what I can do is I can pause before I move on to Roman numerals, Roman numeral, Roman numeral two, and and see if there are questions that people want to ask right now before we we go on in order to not make this um, too too much my dominating things. Uh, I'll just mention that the last limitation I saw was that. Only in a few places have I really attempted to clearly define social capital. You know, I, I use the idea a lot, but really defining what I'm talking about is something that uh, I only struggle with in, in a few areas. I try to deal with this a lot more in the book that Tristan was talking about um, that I have coming out in May 2022, Rethinking Social Capital. And there I actually do try to struggle with the idea of defining what social capital is. Um, now, I'm going to just pause there in case um, people want to, to raise questions or, or observations or um, yeah, so if the, the contrary to what I have here. If anyone wants to pop anything into the chat, um, Marion or I will be happy to read it out for you. Um, otherwise, you can put up your hand within Zoom. You, there's a function to put up your hand. Um, and we can address those questions as they come up. 
Uh, there's nothing in the chat just yet, Carl. So perhaps you could okay, um, okay. Carry, carry on, and we'll see if anything comes up through the presentation. Okay. Yeah. I'm yeah. happy uh, to alert you to anything that needs to be addressed in the chat. It's a bit of a team effort here. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Marion. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. I, um, it, people may prefer for for discussion to wait until until the end. If they do that, that, that that's fine. Um, so the topic of that I came up with for this webinar is in what sense is social capital capital? And that's a part of my struggle to actually define what social capital is. Uh, and maybe one of the areas in which I have the greatest limitations. So I would appreciate any suggestions, recommendations and disagreements uh, you may have uh, as, as I come up with these. Um, and so I, I started out by asking, you know, what is capital? What do we mean by, by capital? Well, the word capital actually is, uh, comes to us from um, antiquity. Uh, it originally referred, you know, capital is, refers to heads. Originally, it referred to head counts of livestock. But by antiquity, it had already come to mean in a general sense, wealth, and jumping forward centuries. By the 19th century, it had come to mean productive wealth. Um, and um, I'm not a Marxist, I'm not a Marxian, uh, but uh, I do think that Marx was one of the most important thinkers on what, on what, on what capital is. Uh, and um, that his thoughts on capitalism in general are relevant to social capitalism. Uh, and Marx refined that idea of capital as wealth, reinforcing the idea of capital as productive wealth. You know, interestingly, this is also one of the areas where Marx had some very favorable things to say about capitalism that although he believed it was exploitative, uh, he also believed it was a highly dynamic system of economic activity and that it led to unprecedented levels of wealth and production in society. Um, his argument essentially was that the abundance that had been produced by capitalism had also created exploitation and inequality. And um, what he was looking forward to was a date at which this abundance could be shared more widely for um, a, a wider range uh, of people. Um, I'm not sure that that happened or that, that it could happen, um, but capital in the sense that he saw it is wealth that is a resource continually reinvested to produce greater wealth. So one characteristic of capital is uh, perpetual increase. That capital is, are resources that are always invested to produce greater resources. Um, and competition is a feature of capital and of its increase in, in the Marxist uh, sense. I, I think this is also something that is true of social capital, that it's inherently competitive in nature. Uh, and um, this is something maybe you might want to uh, talk about. And I think it's something that social capital theorists often overlook, that there is an inherently competitive characteristic to social capital as well as financial capital. So in Marx, you could see the intangible and self-contained nature of capital, that money is a representation of invested value. And this abstract representation of invested value becomes a resource in and of itself that perpetually grows. Um, as invested value, one can distinguish capital from consumption. And I think what this means is that capital entails a future orientation and delayed gratification. 
right? Investment consists of resources that we don't consume in the present, but that we put toward the future, which also means that we don't enjoy them in the present. Maybe from some senses an irrational characteristic of capital uh, that Weber and others you know, had, had struggled with. Uh, in Weber's um, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, I don't think he came up with the right answer, but he did have a good, a good question. And that is, why is it that people choose to invest? Why is it that people choose to put their resources into a future, including an indefinitely postponed future, that they may never enjoy, rather than enjoy their, um, their um, benefit in the present. Uh, so investment has a payoff. In that sense, it's a matter of calculation of costs and benefits. The benefits of future payoff versus the costs of not enjoying capital at the present. Um, and this calculation of costs and benefits is not only material in nature. You know, I would take uh, the work of Rodney Stark, uh, if you're familiar with Rodney Stark's work on um, social capital and on rational choice theory and religion, in which Stark argues somewhat along Weberian lines that self-denial makes for religious purposes makes sense if you're expecting a big payoff in the afterlife or a big payoff in some spiritual sense. But capital always involves rationality, denial of the present, and calculation of the future. Well, human capital developed out of the idea of social capital because economists, primarily economists, began to recognize that the productive use of financial resources doesn't just depend on what kinds of financial resources that you have. Um, I suppose early modern Spain is an illustration of this. Early modern Spain, enormous, had, which had enormous amounts of wealth coming from uh, the New World, um, which presumably could have become a really rich country, became a really poor country uh, because arguably financial resources by themselves are not sufficient to um, invest those financial resources in the most productive outcomes. Um, Gary Becker, Gary S. Becker had argued that investment in skills and training of employees is similar to investment in equipment, that developing knowledge, developing abilities is similar to investing in the material in a company. I, I, and, and I think later on social capital theorists or, or human capital theorists have argued that national human capital is similar to investment in resources. A um, little bit of an aside here. Um, this may actually be an argument for an expanded version of the idea of infrastructure in the United States. I don't know how many of you follow uh, co the contortions of American politics, but we are currently seeing um, debates over what constitutes infrastructure and what constitutes investment in the United States. And the Biden administration has argued that there is such a thing as human infrastructure and investment in pre-kindergarten uh, investment in uh, raising the wages of minimum wage workers uh, is investment in human beings that's similar to investment in roads and bridges. Uh, human capital theory, I think, 
might suggest uh, that that um, the Democrats here are are, are on to something. Um, so um, it, human investment is therefore a matter of productive assets because it creates an increase. Right when you invest in presumably education, this results in an increase in the future. Now, I think that also raises questions about when is investment in education a, an investment in the future and when is it consumption? You know, when is it something that is good because people enjoy it uh, or when is it good because it's going to lead to some kind of payoff in the future? Um, I think there's also something else about investment in human resources, and that is investment in equipment is an asset for a company, but human capital investments don't just benefit companies, they also benefit employees. Um, this, this, you know, may be, may suggest that the idea that capital is always competitive, maybe a little bit too strict, that there are some senses in which capital investment is non-zero sum, that it creates wider benefits. Um, so human capital is not just an analogous to financial capital or an extension of it, but a necessary precondition for financial capital. In order to invest in um, new industries, you have to have people who are educated as engineers who can make use of that investment in new industries. Uh, and some of the forms of human capital, uh, specific knowledge or skills, and you'll see here that the different kinds of capital are gonna begin to bleed into each other and they aren't necessarily completely separable. Uh, specific knowledge and, and skills, how do I do something? How do I um, build a computer? Um, behavioral or organizational skills, what's often called soft skills. How do you work in a company? How do you work together with other people? I think one could plausibly argue that learning to work in diverse environments is a matter of human capital because it's a, a soft skill that people bring to um, the place of employment. Uh, there's also individual and collective human capital. The skills of individuals give them a competitive advantage. Um, but also collective human capital does not necessarily benefit individuals. And if I can make that a little bit clearer, um, yes, we need engineers, but we don't need everyone to be an engineer. We need CEOs, but we don't need everyone to be a CEO. We need people who will clean our streets. You know, that's an essential part of life. Um, but we don't need everyone out cleaning our streets. Now, there may be a difference between what individuals want to achieve for themselves and the diversity of jobs or the diversity of occupations that need to be filled so that um, the skills of individuals give them a competitive advantage, say, if people want to be attorneys, learning the skills to become attorneys gives individuals a benefit. But if we educate everyone to be an attorney, that doesn't have arguably benefits collectively. And some people not being able to become attorneys arguably is a um, disadvantage or lack of opportunity for them. I, I see we have some things in the chat here. So before going on to the different kinds of capital, talking about cultural capital and social capital, 
I'm going to pause. And Marion, are there things that um, people have asked that yep. I should address? Okay. Okay. I'm going back to um, Chris has asked the first question. Uh, Chris, uh -huh. did you want to unmute and ask Carla a question yourself? Sure. Thank you. Um, so I, I think we can transfer or transfer access to other types of capital. Um, such as transferring our financial capital, leasing physical capital, or hiring for human capital. And so I'm just curious, when you're thinking about this social capital as capital, what are examples of the modes of transferring social capital? Hmm. Yeah, that might be something that I'll get to as I talk about what social capital is. Um, so, you know, that's a good question. I'm not sure it's a question that I can necessarily deal with adequately but if you don't mind i'm, I'm gonna um put it off chris until i actually talk about what what social capital is and then if you would remind me of that and raise it again um and if i can't come up with adequate answers maybe you can help me out uh the next one is salmi from morocco um, uh -huh. asking you a question about what difference, I'm not sure if they want to ask it themselves, uh, what difference between human capital and cultural capital in sociology? Mm, okay. So, um, me, are you there? Did you want to talk to that? No? Hello, Mr. Uh, Carl. Hello. Uh, yeah. you, you, uh, you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so my question is about uh, human and the cultural uh, capital. Uh, in uh, uh, when I read some articles, the same when we ask about human, are the same human capital and cultural cultural capital on sociology. This yeah. is my question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's a good question. Um, I, I had mentioned that uh, many of these things bleed into each other. Um, and I'll talk about cultural capital in a minute, but I would say that um, these two things bleed into each other and maybe become almost indistinguishable at B, that is soft skills. Uh, because when we talk about cultural capital, we normally think of habits or norms that are resources in some sense and beho behavioral and organizational skills, you could argue are also what cultural aspects, right? That uh, I think you could argue that, um, for example, punctuality is a cultural characteristic they can also be seen as an organizational asset. Uh, and so, you know, that might be where cultural capital and, uh, and, and human capital bleed into each other or are not readily distinguishable. Now, I think there are some areas in which it's much easier to distinguish human capital from, from, uh, from uh, cultural capital. For example, um, if, um, if I know how to fix a, if I know how to um, fix plumbing, I don't actually. Um, but if I knew how to, how, to, how, to, how to do plumbing, one might say that that's a human, that's human capital, that that's a skill. Now, you know, there may be, um, and maybe this kind of addresses part of what Chris was asking. Um, there may be you know, cultural factors behind developing that skill, right? That, that push me to go to vocational school and learn how to, to fix plumbing. But knowing how to do something is, I think a, a, would be defined as a human capital skill, whereas norms, values, and habits would be defined as cultural capital. Did that sort of address the question? 
tell me? Uh, um, did, 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 that, did that address, the, did, did yes, my response yes, I, kind of address the question? Yes, yes, I understand, uh, I understand because uh, I work, uh, I work uh, about uh, social capital and entrepreneurship for women migrants. Right. And uh -huh. uh, when I when and I work about human capital and cultural capital, we uh, uh, I found the experience, the experience, the experience for women migrants. I I don't know if I put here in cultural capital or in human capital. Ah, uh, uh, okay, yeah, I would tend to classify experience as human capital. Um, although there are what cultural traits associated with experience. Um, but uh, you know, I would put experience as a part of human capital. It's a good question. You know, most questions that are good questions are also hard questions. And that is both a good question and a hard question. And we can certainly see how all of these forms of capital start to blur together a little bit because there's a bit of this and a bit of that in, in most situations. So it is yeah, incredibly well, I mean, complex. Well, I mean, these are concept; these are conceptual distinctions. Um, you know, we want to avoid reification. These are not objective realities. These are conceptual distinctions and attempts to provide a a map of the uh, the landscape of reality. Um, but you know, in in response to the question. Um, you know, I would say that um, skills and abilities, including, say, experience, I, I think most sociologists would classify experience um, degrees, demonstrable abilities as, let's say, indicators of human capital. Did that, did that make sense? Okay, Marion, do we have other? Yep, yeah. uh, we've uh -huh. actually got, uh, Elizabeth has made more of an observation uh, about okay. the difficulties of cost benefit approach, et cetera. Um, and that's the last question before we resume, um, but it's not really a question, it's more an observation. Elizabeth, did sure. you want to ask, turn that into a question for Carl? Uh, well, I think you asked it the next thing about, um, you know, so given the fact that the costs are usually very obvious in what you're going to need to develop something, but the opportunities and outcomes are more emergent and unpredictable, you know, how do you um, generate some sort of calculus um, for things that aren't readily calculable? Yeah, um, and yeah. as Marion noted, is this, that often leads to underinvestment in them. Yeah, good question. You know, I think the, the answer that I would give is that that I don't make the calculation that people who make the investment make the calculation. Like um, when people are deciding in, in Rodney Stark's sense that um, becoming a member of a fundamentalist church has payoffs, they're the ones making the calculation. Uh, and you have to take their calculation at, 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 at their face value. Now that's, that's also a kind of calculation where it's really hard to test, maybe impossible to test whether it actually paid off for them. Um, I mean, we do know that um, not spending all of your money, but putting in, 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 in the market um, it, it, it can have payoffs, but that doesn't guarantee that you'll get those payoffs. I mean, that's the other thing about cost benefit analyses when they look at futures, the future is inherently unpredictable. And, you know, I could put, I could starve myself and put all of my money into the market and the market could collapse tomorrow, right? So I'm making cost benefit analyses, but, um, and, 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 you know, I think the point is that I'm doing this on the basis of my calculation of costs and benefits but you're exactly right that whether those costs, whether those benefits actually come about is difficult to predict and sometimes unpredictable. Did, did that answer the question? It, it pointed at it, I mean, and I think Kiyomi made a nice point too, so I'll let them respond. Okay. 
did we want to continue the, we've had a few more questions but did we want to continue a little bit with the presentation and come back to those there's question two questions there i, th I think we, we can continue. come back to those yeah if we can okay. continue carl yeah. i'm not sure how much time you have but we're we're about 45 minutes in already that's okay i'm i'm not uh, i'm not pressed for time um uh, my my only uh, limitation here is the patience and endurance of my audience uh, and so far they so far they seem to be doing uh, well, uh, doing yeah. Well. Hamemia uh, and uh, Kiyomi will answer questions uh, when we pause next. Okay, over to you, Carl. Okay, yeah. Well, uh, um, uh, uh, I think it was uh, Selmi had had raised the question about cultural capital, um, and cultural capital in the literature is kind of defined in, and, and I, I uh, give short shrift to cultural capital here, in part because I tend to fold it into social capital. But it is often talked about as a separate thing. Uh, some portray it as useful characteristics. Like for example, delayed gratification, orientation toward work, constructive behavior, um, the kinds of norms and values that will pay off for people. Others, following Bourdieu, look at cultural capital as a matter of cultural markers that provide entry into privileged situations. Like, presumably, if you develop a taste in, um, in art, that this will mark you as a member of a, of, of a group that um, has advantages in a society and so you'll be accepted uh, and this will have payoffs for you. Uh, and those two different views, I think both have some relevance, um, but I tend to fold cultural capital into social capital. Um, and social capital, properly speaking, consists of relationships as investments. Um, and first, you could cons pe first people consider cultural capital as social capital. When people hold norms and values that promote cooperation, such as trust, this is an investment in shared enterprises. In fact. You, you'll find some people who define trust as social capital. Um, Francis Fukuyama wrote a book entitled Trust, in which he um, essentially deals with trust as social capital. And it's true that you know, some level of trust is essential for people being able to work together. Um, and social capital, in this sense, I think is very Durkheimian. It's a matter of moral community. It's a matter of social capital consists of shared norms and values that enable people to live and work together. That cultural capital as social capital binds individuals into aggregates. And so it operates across levels. Now, um, I think that culture is, is a part of what we talk about social capital. In my own work, I tend to focus more on network connections as social capital and look at cultural orientations uh, within the context of network connections, that patterns of connections among people can be assets. This, by the way, is I think where um, the, the, the most Coleman-esque part, the, the, where James S. Coleman comes in most directly, that uh, social capital consists of patterns of connections among people or, you know, network connections. Uh, Coleman brought normative orientations in, into networks, arguing that patterns of relationships maintain norms. But along with norms, networks maintain control and direction over individuals. And networks provide, in addition, information channels that give 
access to resources. Um, the idea of capital as inhering in patterns of relations does raise the question of which patterns will pay off, right? And, and I think this kind of touches on what Elizabeth had raised, right? If we're calculating benefits, how do we know what those benefits will be? Um, well, um, the answer is we don't, right? Is it, especially with, with regard to financial capital, the markets could collapse tomorrow. But with regard to social capital, how do we know what patterns of relationships will actually pay off for people? This raises the question of the patterns that actually will pay off or the strength of the old strength of weak ties arguments, right? That in some situations being tightly bound to other people with high levels of control and direction, enable them to work together and to collaborate with each other and therefore to promote their group advancement and the advancement of individuals in other groups. But of course, the strength of weak ties argument suggests that under some circumstances for individuals, being a part of a tightly bound group can be a disadvantage. Uh, and so what I suggest is that what kind of pattern, uh, what, what kind of network pattern consists, um, constitutes social capital might depend on the kind of information held by a net network. Like if you're looking for housing, the extent to which information about housing exists within your network determines the extent to which your network is an asset or a source of social capital. And it also depends on access of network members to outside resources. The more resources you can bring into your network, the more likely it is that your network will have a benefit. Um, and finally, or at least in terms of the, the way that, that I draw these distinctions, social capital is often considered as engagement the extent to which individuals are committed to and involved in larger levels of participation. Um, the involvement of individuals in shared activities can be seen as a resource. And I think that's like the Robert S. Putnam approach. And the shared activities might be informal and in, informal, but there are stable form of investment when they're institutionalized. For example, even if your institution is a bowling club, the fact that it's a club and that it's consistent means that you're engaged, right? Or the PTA, PTO, is a formal organization and that helps to maintain its stability. And so I think that's part of Putnam's emphasis on formal organizations. Now, I'm gonna stop there for a minute and um, field questions, discuss. Mm -hmm. We have, uh, oh, sorry. We have the first question back from uh, Herminio, who's been coming mm -hmm. online. Uh, Herminio, did you want to um, ask your question? Yes, uh, you can. Can you hear me? No, no, can you hear me? Hey, how are you? Yes, I can. Thank you. Um, and this is just for the sake of curiosity, but but actually, really, I'm doing my dissertation on currently doing it on relative on, on topics of social capital and other forms of capital. Mm -hmm. Um. My question is this, uh, this is related to the, how we look at the capital in the future. Are there some ways that we can put all these forms of capital, like social capital, cultural capital, and other forms into the blockchain using the cryptography that we may be able to use this for another way of you know, exchange or trade? 
Thank you. Um, I'm not sure that, that, I, that you're getting some uh, interference with your questions. I'm not sure that I completely caught everything you were asking. Um, it, uh, it has to do with some of the uh, the research on blockchain, I think, that uh, uh, Hermenio okay. yeah, is doing, yeah. which is sort of like yeah. speaking Venusian to me, but... <laughs> Well, I know what I know what blockchains are in in the in a general sense. Um, I I don't um, I, I'm skeptical of uh, cryptocurrencies, um, but my skepticism may be rooted in ignorance. Um, uh, you know, I would think that to the extent that I understand blockchains, this is kind of an extension of the idea of social capital. Uh, because blockchains are ways in which people are impersonally locked into networks of control and direction. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, so I would think that, uh, and it's a way in which um, what trust is automatically enforced or or institutionally enforced. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So, so I would, you know, uh, knowing very, knowing very little about blockchains other than, well, this is how cryptocurrencies, which I don't deal with, work. Um, you know, I would say that, yeah, this is, would be an illustration of an extension of social capital. And, and I guess one of the interesting ideas here is the idea that social capital may extend beyond face-to-face -face interactions. Um, so yeah, that, that's a, a really interesting question about yep. something that um, I really know very little about. Huh. Um, Carla, thanks, Amelia. Um, uh -huh. Fascinating area. Uh, uh, Kiyomi, did you have a question? I think it's more an observation that you actually made in the chat. Did you have a particular question for Carl? Um, thank you so much, I'm Kiyomi. Um, yeah, when we, carry, uh, when we um, measure the social capital, so after something happened, we can measure the social capital um, as uh, income, uh, in the income situation, uh, uh, as the uh, outcome situation, yeah, yeah. But, mm -hmm. I have one question about the uh, um, social capital measurement. Because after something happen, I can measure the social capital. But before something happen, can we calculate the social capital? Because um, my interesting research theme is uh, um, disaster, um, natural disaster management area. So after natural disaster happened, yeah, it's easy to see the social capital rule uh, law or social capital how it worked well. Yeah, but before natural disaster happen, still we have to think about resilience part. So now my interesting period is the resilience part of natural disaster. That's why before natural disaster happen, how can we measure or how can we discuss about the importance of social capital? Yeah, it is uh, my question. Thank you. Yeah, uh, great, great, uh, great question. Um, I think that Tristan, when you look at the wicked problems of social capital, this might be one of the ones that you want to include. Um, a little bit later, I'll talk about the fact that one of the difficulties with social capital is that it tends to be tautological in nature, that we know it by its, we, uh, um, what, de fructibus cognoscenti, that, that we know it by its outcomes. Um, and so Kiyomi might be on to something, uh, well, I'm sure she's on to something, and that is that um, we define social capital by its benefits, but until we see those benefits, how do we know that it exists? Um, so, yeah, I think that's a problem with the idea of social capital, right? I'm, uh, uh, and and uh, so... Um, I'm not sure how we could measure, essentially what you're talking about is what kinds of soci social situations create preparedness for say a disaster so that we will know how well people can respond after disaster. Does that make sense? Um, 
I'm sure there must be a way, um, you know, looking at other ways in which people have collaborated in the past. But there again, that's a matter of looking at the fruits of past interactions. And, I, you know, one of the challenges maybe of social capital is that it always tends to be tautological. We always look at it in terms of outcomes. Uh, does, uh, Tristan, does that make sense to you as one of the wicked problems? Yeah, so one of the wicked problems that I presented was the potentiality nature of social yeah. capital. And I think this is an emerging area of research that's quite current. And we had a, a webinar a couple of months ago by Evangelos Tontis, who was working in the area of social psychology and looking at social capital in, in disaster type situations. And it's really fascinating how, uh, you know, emergent communities can come about in response to a particular disaster and um, people's actions and behavior can be shaped by the context of that particular disaster in ways that are very difficult to predict ahead of time. And so I think, you know, this speaks to, to what Kiyomi is talking about. It speaks to what you're talking about as well, Carl, and it speaks to this, you know, kind of uncertainty about the outcomes of social capital. Um, and the way in which we tend to see the benefits as, as the outcomes um, without really being able to particularly understand perhaps the processes that are occurring um, that may lead to those particular mm -hmm. outcomes, of course, depending on context. You know, context is key, you know, as we right. hear about all the time. You, you know, it strikes me that one way that we might try to deal with this might be to look at, say, communities that have experienced disasters and to look at which, um, at the characteristics of those communities before the disaster and which ones have dealt with those disasters more effectively and less effectively and try to develop uh, rubrics of preparedness from, from those, if that makes any sense. Well, I think this is I a fa fascinating area of research, I think. Absolutely. Yeah, I see that yeah, mm -hmm. couldn't we, uh, maybe, uh, Miss Sunny's asking a question specifically about an example of the Vietnamese students. Oh, <laughs> She's yeah. asked a question and also raised her hand. So maybe yes. so a discussion I like, there. I feel like it really builds on this particular point. Like it's exactly right where you, it's a jump off place from where you are right now. So what I'm doing is, I, well, I'm a high school teacher. I teach in California and Sacramento. And I came across social capital 10 years ago as a concept in my head working on what I consider to be academic wealth. So as an outcome of academic wealth building is social capital in terms of skills, in terms of readiness, in terms of social interactions. There's so many outcomes that are what, what you would define as social capital outcomes. And of course, they're not defined until the very, you know, the late future. You don't know when what you plant is going to grow. So to the point of us not being able to measure the immediacy of the need before something we can't foresee happens, then going all the way back to being proactive, how do we teach kids from kindergarten, pre-K, all the way through high school, I'm working on a program that actually teaches that resiliency for children. Uh, hmm. And I was wondering if you saw a concrete example in your research with the Vietnamese youngsters, what specifically kinds of things were they doing? I imagine an answer that you might come up with, but I'd like to hear from you, what specifically were the students doing that, that, that gave us those social capital outcomes? What was the input? What was going on? Okay, yeah, yeah. Um... I guess, you know, the input I would um, say was less um, directed toward the students than toward their community situations. Um, some of the things that I had talked about that prepared students were um, out, of school, out of school programs on the part of the community itself that, uh, that, that worked with students. So, so um, I guess specifically what I'm looking for are classroom interactions. What are they doing mm -hmm. in the classroom? Because obviously a classroom teacher has umpteen opportunities every day to create social capital. Like we can develop it. We can, we can grow it as long as we understand what we're cultivating. So if we're not yeah. planting the right seeds, we're not growing the right crops. And I'm, I'm, I'm on a mission to really ensure that 
as a as a profession we are uh -huh. preparing youngsters for the potentiality of emergency the potentiality of right. opportunity to create their own opportunities and like i see in the classroom the discussion i see different things i see like learning to to talk quietly learning to interact with people who don't look like you um there's there's a million opportunities that we have and i was just wondering if you had um, obviously, your research looks at community, but if there was anything right. that you could you could note that they were because the community transfers things, but not everybody in a particular classroom is part of that community. How do those skills yeah. transfer there? Hmm. Yeah, that's that's an interesting. Yeah, um, and that maybe also I talked about the limitate my own limitations, and w one of my limitations might be that I look primarily at what kids students bring from their families and communities to the schools, which does leave out of consideration what are the um, process factors, that is what the schools actually do socially. Um, off the top of my head, um, what I would say is that an, a logical extension would be activities that promote cooperation within the classroom. Um, group activities would build relationships among students so that students could share with each other. Um, does that, you know, and, and I realize that that is not um, a very full answer to your question. And uh, it- No, oh, absolutely. Absolutely elegant. I think that, well, I mean, being that it's kind of, like, to be honest with you, I've, I've been looking for people that have anything like my research at all. And I, it's, it's hard, it's, it's nearly impossible to find someone that focuses on, on, on this at the, you know, five year for five-year-olds, for six-year-olds, yeah. for seven-year-olds. Oh, yeah. But yeah, I just, yeah. I have to say, if we could backtrack and focus on this particular form of of uh, this, if we could emphasize capital, de social capital development from young children all the way through their 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 middle, their high school, all the way through their their academic career, we would really have a society of humans that was much more capable, competent, and prepared to create and chase opportunities. Yeah, uh, maybe. Um, unfortunately, this outline is already drawn. Otherwise, I'd go back and um, include your points in uh, the things that I talk about in, uh, in, in policy. Um, uh, you make a really good point, and that is if we are going to deal with social capital, this occurs at very young ages. And if we're going to promote cooperation among kids, and we probably want to do that at, at very young ages. Um, I, I do think, you know, that there are what limits of, of what we can do uh, because yes, students are in schools, but they're also in their homes. And we also have to deal with not only what they bring from home, but also what parents are willing to accept in schools. Um, so it may be a matter of how do you sell these things to parents? But yeah, that's a good point. Um, thank you. I think I it's also a yeah. really, sorry, it's a really good example also of the crossover between the different forms of capital because, you know, developing social skills, perhaps empathy, you know, theory of mind, these kinds of individual competencies, we might consider to be human capital. But then perhaps some of the more, you know, values yeah. and beliefs and those things we might call cultural capital or perhaps social capital, depending on how you define it. So your point earlier yeah, you, about, you know, the putting things in boxes is just a conceptual tool. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, as far as what schools do, um, this is also a matter not only of environmental context, but also ideological context. I mean, what schools can do in the United States is a matter of what public ideologies toward education. Um, uh, a matter about which, you know, I don't know how many of you follow uh, our um, unfortunately contorted and conflicted situation here, but schools are kind of at the center of what ideological conflicts here. 
And so very often what schools are able to do in terms of teaching cultural values um, has to take place within what wider cultural struggles. Um, and yeah, schools are at the center of what's often called the culture wars within the United States. Um, you know, one of the things I'll, I'll try to bring out when we get to policy is that um, I think one of the challenges is that we simply can't do things from the top down, whether that's desirable or not, because you have to get pay, you have to get people to agree. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I it, think um, mm -hmm. Sean um, had a question, but I think sure. has left. No, Sean's back. Um, Sean, did you want to ask your question? Go oh. ahead. Sorry, it's hard. I think he dropped out temporarily, but uh, hopefully he's back now. Yeah, just conscious of Carl's time. Yeah, I am. That, as that's well. okay. That's as I said. Um, I'm not. I'm only constrained by the endurance of uh, the other participants. You know, I, I yep. don't know to what extent they can um, put yeah. up with me. For so, Sean, yeah, Sean's back. I think he might be having okay. technology problems, but yeah, oh, he's on. Yeah. Yeah, I am. Um, sorry about that. My um, Wi-Fi dropped out and uh, I had to reconnect again. Sorry. Um, so sorry for wasting time. My, my question was going to be about Daniel Goleman um, and his concept of mirror neurons. Um, to talk about where, when people act together in a similar way, the mirror neurons fire. Um, can you talk about them as um, conducive to social capital or, or cultural capital? Do you, you get mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, I guess that's a matter of the um, biology of social capital, right? Is that um, to what extent are interpersonal relationships um, um, reflected in the organization of um, neural networks? Um, and you know, maybe I'll leave that question to somebody who knows more about neuropsychology um, rather than wade into something that's really kind of beyond my competence. Uh, Perhaps if I could suggest, Sean, if you can hold uh -huh. off um, and, and if Carl can continue on um, oh, a little bit and we might be able to come back for a general discussion on that at the end. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No worries. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So in what sense is social capital capital on the model of financial capital? And, you know, this kind of deals with some of the questions about definition. And the way I pro approach this is what are the characteristics of financial capital? One is that it's readily quantifiable in units of currency whether those units of, of currency are, are dollars, pounds, uh, euros, or, or other um, or shells or other representations of value. Um, I also suggest that amounts of financial capital are always positive. Now, what I, I don't mean by that that amounts of financial capital are always normatively positive. Um, Debt is not negative capital, but a deficiency of investable resources. That financial capital consists of investable resources. Uh, and to say that financial capital is always positive is not to say that it's always invested in desirable projects, right? Um, you know, I could invest my money in the petrochemical industry, which people will have different views. I would argue that the petrochemical industry has what, enormous environmental damages, and I would suggest that, that it would be a negative outcome. Nevertheless, I'm invested, investing positive amounts of money toward that negative outcome. But it's not the objective, but the resources that are positive in the sense that you can count them. Um, and it is an asset, even when it results in a loss, that it's, it's non-tautological, right? If, if I have um, 
$5,000 and I put it in um, the tech industry and the tech industry collapses tomorrow, which might happen. Um, and I, I lose the, the, all of my money. That money was still an asset. Um, financial capital can exist at the individual level uh, as investments and it can be aggregated but it exists at, spe at specific levels of, of analysis. In other words, national wealth is aggregated individual wealth. Um, financial capital is intentional. It is acquired as an investment for the sake of investment. Ownership of financial capital is generally clear, you know, not you know, I'm not suggesting here that um, there, there's, you know, a normative application to the idea of ownership that, that somebody should have uh, X amount of capital and somebody else should have a different amount of capital, but it's clear who holds it, right? It's clear that if the company owns it, if I own it. Now, some of the characteristics of social capital, I'm sorry here for the, the mess up in the um, in the outline, as I was doing this on different computers, they seem, seem to want to interpret the outline differently. Um, social capital exists within relationships among individuals. It's contextual. Relationships can be assets in some situations and not in other situations. Um, and as we were talking about earlier, relationships are assets because they have productive outcomes, because they have productive consequences. There's a tautology problem in social capital. Relationships become assets across levels of analysis. They involve norms held by individuals. Norms and patterns of behavior exist in relationships of individuals. And patterns of behavior are properties of social networks. Social networks exist within institutionalized and formal settings. So, you know, one of the problems of, of social capital is what level of, of, of analysis is it located at? Is it located at the individual level, the group level, the, um, the organizational level? My suggestion is it's across all of those levels. You know, is, is that it comes into existence across levels, which I think is a distinction between social capital and financial capital. So, you know, it follows that we can't locate social capital at any particular level. And the assets of, uh, generated by social relationships are specific aspects of complex multivalent phenomena, right? Like we think of financial capital as it exists for purposes of specific investment. If we think about our, our relationships with other people though, our relationships with other people have many different aspects to them, many different purposes. Um, they're much more complicated than does it lead to a particular outcome? Um, does it lead to a a benefit. Um, and the real assets among individuals uh, produced by relationships are often unintended consequences. Um, an illustration of this, one of the um, uh, examples of religious institutions as social capital often involves what Korean churches that Rotating loan associations often operate less today than in the past, uh, but uh, rotating loan associations among Koreans often operate because people have connections to each other in churches. Well, they don't form those churches in order for, for, for economic purposes, right? The, the, um, the, the, the social capital is a byproduct of their social relationship rather than an intentional goal-oriented purpose. Now, um, I also uh, 
deal with the problem of what negative social capital, uh, I tend not to accept the idea. And um, uh, and you can you can tell me if you think I'm wrong about this. Um, uh, you know, Alejandro Portes identifies this idea of negative social capital. You know, and I think he kind of um, combines different things is that social capital can be negative because it leads to undesirable outcomes. Well, financial capital can also lead to undesirable outcomes, um, but also because social capital can depress outcomes, can be unproductive. Um, Portes says that social capital can be negative because it leads to the exclusion of outsiders. I think that's true, that social capital, um, precisely because it's often uh, competitive in character, often does lead to what advancing my group as opposed to other groups. And if resources are generated by people cooperating with each other, People cooperating with each other entails identifying who you cooperate with and who you don't cooperate with. So there often is some amount of exclusion in inherent in the idea of social capital. Um, but you know, I, I, I don't think that that means that social capital itself is negative, but that it can have negative consequences. Um, it can also, according to Portes, have excess claims on group members. Uh, this is you know, kind of linked to the level pro, uh, program that we saw in, in human capital, that assets for groups may not necessarily be assets for individuals, that sacrificing yourself for the sake of the group can be a source of group social capital, but it's not necessarily an asset for you as an individual. And connected to that, according to Portes, uh, social capital can lead to restrictions on individual freedom. True, I think. And especially in terms of um, control and guidance that social capital often does restrict the individual freedom of individuals. Um, which is one of the reasons that, you know, I, I, I would suggest a little bit later on that we can't really separate social capital questions from ideological questions. Um, and finally, you know, this is a sense in which I think social, the, ne the term negative social capital is most often used, that it can be a matter of downward leveling norms. In other words, having close ties to the people around you might promote upward mobility, but also having close ties to the people around you might be um, a matter of um, the nail that stands out gets hammered down. And when all the nails get hammered down, this doesn't necessarily promote upward mobility. Or it has been argued that um, among disadvantaged communities, uh, having little access to information or resources outside of the community, that having only connections within your community reinforces and perpetuates those disadvantages. Now, I think that's true, but you know, I would suggest that in that case, the answer is not to label that negative capital, but to say that in that case, relationships to other people don't constitute capital. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna uh, pause there. And uh, Marion, um, are there other questions or comments? Yeah, th uh, there is a question there from Aisha. Aisha, yeah. Uh -huh. Go ahead, Aisha. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. yes, I can. Thank you, good to see you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carl. And a uh, super interesting topic. I was, I have been waiting for this presentation because my PhD work is really um, in going in the direction and I'm, I'm basing my framework of exactly the point you are raising at the moment, you know, the, the negative social capital. 
I'm doing ethnographic research in Italy among Pakistani migrants in, um, with regard to the negative social capital of already settled migrants in Italy and effect like uh, in a sense on the new migrants who are coming in new and prospective migrants. But I'm taking actually, besides Alejandro Porters, I'm taking also Floya Anthea's uh, mobilizability mm -hmm. concept, you know, for this, uh, right. for my work, because mm -hmm. I, I, I intend to look at, you know, um, on mobilizability, mo mobilizability uh, ability mm -hmm. of new migrants. And then mm -hmm. of course, looking at how uh, the new and prospective migrants are able to mobilize these own ethnic networks and, of course, I'm also now trying to figure out within one, one of the sectors that is informal labor sector, very, very uh, predominantly found in Italian labor sector, where I'm, I'm trying to figure out how these ethnic networks who are strongly uh, influential in the inf providing informal labor sector jobs, how they are able to you know, keep hold on these new and prospective migrants. But my argument, as you are saying, that I also have problems in trying to really look at to at these uh, social capital as is it's in itself as a whole negative aspect because i also see that of course people are dependent on these already settled migrants and they need to get attached until their legal status becomes into some kind of uh, uh, you know more uh, more better that they can you know get rid of these kind of you know uh, from their own ethnic networks so i i i is, now i'm trying to like actually see how special how a temporality actually can play a role in the negative effect of the social capital and how with a certain time frame it can get reduced or maybe diminish from negative social capital to maybe a bit of more neutral uh, capital. I would just like yeah. to have a comment on this because this is exactly yeah. my framework already. I'm working on it. It's it's really much yeah. in the you know in the air now. <laughs> but yeah. I would yeah. yeah, this sounds like an interesting project on uh, how ethnicity can function as, as social capital. Um, uh, and, and I guess um, that is also something else than that is that we often think about social capital as promoting upward mobility or promoting economic advancement. Um, but that's not the only thing, those aren't the only things we utilize our interpersonal connections for. Uh, and many of the people who talk about negative social capital also talk about the fact that it may not promote upward mobility, but it may enable people who are outsiders in a society to help each other psychologically, mm -hmm. uh, which I would think is um, a form of capital, which I would think is a, is a kind of payoff. So I guess you know the the other thing about social capital is that it can it can pay off in different ways, um, and a payoff in terms of psychological adaptation may not be a payoff in terms of upward mobility, uh, and it may also depend on what access the Pakistani migrants that you're looking at have to opportunities in the larger Italian society. Um, if they're excluded from, totally excluded from all opportunities in the larger Italian society and their co-ethnics are their only supports, sources of support, um, then it would no, make no sense, I think, to say that their connections to other uh, members of their ethnic group press them down since, um, you know, presumably their co-ethnics help them find uh, apartments, uh, help yeah. them um, yeah. um, deal with situations that they wouldn't otherwise deal with. Um, yeah, yeah that, 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 that's the point. And that's the that's the limitation that these new uh, yeah. new migrants, they are they they don't have language skills. They don't they are very uh, low education and, you know, the, the other skills, they have very low human capital. So the dependency, actually, the dependency on the settled migrants, because they have been there for several years now, and they know the system, how it works, and they have established their own, you know, um, uh, enterprises or something like in the businesses or maybe shops or whatever. And they have these opportunities to offer them to the, you know, to the new migrants, which really make them dependent on these people. Even if they have to, like, you know, interact with the Italian employers, they need the 
you know, they need these uh, uh, middlemen of, from their own ethnic networks. So, yeah, it, it, it is definitely very much dependent on these, uh, on, the, on the already established networks there. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's very similar to uh, what my co-author Min Jo dealt with in some of her early work on um, Chinese immigrants in the New York City area. Um, mm -hmm. Many of them were in extremely limited economic circumstances and uh, often working in um, textiles, doing piecework. Mm -hmm. And um, she had argued that their ethnic networks were essential support sources of support and social capital for them. She had been criticized by some who argued that reliance on ethnic networks were preventing individuals from becoming part of the larger society yeah. and maintaining them in, uh, in, a low in, in, in their low income statuses. Mm -hmm. Her response was that, well, they didn't have access to opportunities in the larger society, that their ethnic networks, yes, did not give the middle-class standards of living Mm -hmm. by, by the U.S. standard, but did give them supports, help them find places to live, yeah. uh, provide them access to child care, and mm -hmm. therefore within the limits of what was available to them, that their net ethnic networks were critical sources of capital. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, here also it, it might become obvious that many of the ideas that I have on social capital are not original. Um, I don't think there's any such thing as an original idea. If there were, we probably wouldn't understand it. Uh, but um, you know, the ideas that I have are all kind of bits and pieces drawn from Coleman and Portes and um, and 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 Minjo and kind of reassembled in different situations. But yeah, what what you're describing to me sounds very similar to what she was describing. Um, and it also points, I think, to the contextual nature of social capital. I, I just have a quick, uh, uh, you mm -hmm. know, follow up comment on that, if I may. Sure. Do you think so that time and temporality have, have an important role to play in the negativity of social capital? If we look at the negative social capital, like Porter's mentions, does it really mm -hmm. go uh, down the way or does it diminish over the time when the, you know, migrants, the new migrants are also settled or they are, you know, going along, um, um, you know, in that situation. And the, does time play a role? Because I would be interested to, to look at mm. that element as well. Hmm. And, and I, I guess what you're asking by time is, do their ethnic networks over time enable them to achieve upward mobility or over time does it depress them? Is exactly. That, is that correct? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I think Portes, when he's talking about negative social capital, um, is describing a situation in which over time people are not able to achieve upward mobility or get outside the network. Um, mm. And uh, in his work on Cubans, I mm. think his argument essentially was that ethnic connections among Cubans in the United States were a source of social capital because although they were often disadvantaged relative to those outside their networks, over time this enabled them to um, save money, um, mm. send their children to school and achieve upward mm. mobility. So yeah, I think probably time is, you know, what happens over time is a critical issue. Yeah, okay, thank you so much. Well, so how about, we, how about we continue, Carl, um, just sure. in the interest of time. There are a couple of other questions, but hopefully we can get to them at the end. Yeah, yeah. Well, given these complications with social capital, is it a useful concept? Um, and, and I'm gonna answer yes. It, one might say that um, my answering yes is self-interested since I've written a lot about social capital. And if I were to say no, then 
um, I would essentially be saying that I've been uh, spewing out nonsense. Um, but aside from that, Aside from that, you know, I, I think that the social capital concept is, is a useful one. First, it provides us with a way of thinking about causation among different kinds of productivity. I think uh, a question that um, somebody had raised earlier about how these different things connect to each other, um, that we can think about social capital in the creation of financial capital and of human capital and financial capital in the sense that James Coleman talks about. That it's useful for understanding when skills and financial resources may pay off. Uh, that it moves productive forces, and I'm gonna go through this kind of quickly in the interest of time and then we'll get to questions, um, beyond a purely individual level. That groups and cooperation uh, establish productivity. Um, that um, that recognizing that assets are generated at different levels is a theoretical problem, but also an important contribution because it enables a functional approach to norms, networks, and institutions. Um, and it provides a way of examining not only efficiency at particular levels, but also how levels, you know, how individual level and group level and um, national level may be interconnected. And, and, and finally, you know, maybe I'll, I'll run through these and then we'll open up for questions. You may have the most questions about my thoughts on policy considerations. Um, as I say, Policy is what I have worked on the least and probably where my, my um, thoughts are the least adequate. And so you may be able to um, contribute to this or correct me where I seem to be off. Um, that social capital theory makes us recognize that financial increasing financial expenditures or skills and abilities alone will not achieve policy objectives. And I think, you know, this is something maybe Miss Sunny was touching on when she talked about developing social capital of people at very young ages. Um, it draws our attention to supporting and building institutions and norms that encourage collaboration among individuals within communities and broader political institutions. That it draws our attention to the importance of engagement in stable, persistent activities and acceptance of shared activities. I also think though that social capital might make us think about the limitations of social policy. You know, and, and here, I, you know, I may be um, reacting or overreacting against some of the things I see in, in my own discipline that tend to think there are policy solutions for everything. And, you know, we could um, make life perfect and create the perfect society if only we would come up with the right policies. Um, and, you know, I think that social capital theory might make us think about the limitations of policy in part because social capital, like financial capital, consists of, al of assets. Policy is unavoidably ideological. How we invest assets is not just a practical question, but also an ideological question, a question of values. And social capital ideas alone cannot determine ideology. Uh, social capital also consists of relationships among people. And relationships among people are highly complex and don't lend themselves readily to manipulation by policy, regardless of mechanisms for establishing policy, regardless of those, whether those mechanisms are democratic in nature or top-down. Um, 
human relationships are, are highly complex and not easily shaped uh, by, by, by policy directives. Um, even when those policy directives are democratic in, in origin. Um, and we can't take policies that appear to achieve desired results in one historical context and assume that they will work in the same way in other contexts. And I label this the getting to Denmark problem. I don't know if you're familiar with that phrase that political scientists sometimes talk about the goal of political societies as getting to Denmark because Denmark is an affluent society. It uh, has some of the highest scores on international measures of, of happiness. By most measures, Denmark is a highly successful society. Some people would argue that it's the most successful society. So the goal of every national political system could be seen as getting to Denmark, right? Well, the problem with that is the United States is not Denmark, nor is Nigeria. And so arguably things that work in Denmark, because they work because of the historical context of the Danes, uh, and because of the relate their, their social relationships, their attitudes toward governments, those are not readily transferable as a whole to others, which doesn't mean that other societies can't look at them and, um, and think about what might work in their own contexts. Um, and so some of the conclusions that I would draw about the application of social capital theory to policy, and here I'm on the thinnest ice, um, uh, are um, considerations of social capital can help us discuss how to achieve objectives, but they can't tell us what those objectives are. That's uh, getting back to the ideological problem in social capital theory. Since social capital is embedded in relationships among people, I would argue that this implies that building social capital is by nature gradual and incremental. You know, I would think that based on the idea of social capital that I've traced that grand visions of transforming societies are mirages, that social capital works over time by developing institutions among groups of people, developing bonds of trust among people. And that takes time, it's a, a historical phenomenon. Uh, and ideological questions like individual liberty versus collective obligations are always relevant to social capital oriented policies. For example, one of the responses to how do we build social capital in this country, which um, I, I don't know how many of you would see this the same way that I would, but I would say that my own country is in a, a fairly lamentable state right now. Um, the building social capital in this country is difficult because it's an ideological question and for example, one of the responses that's often suggested is um, national service. Um, that's a heavily ideological question. And whether one supports compulsory national service, the extension of voluntary national service, or as I suspect many Americans would, um, not having national service at all, uh, these are ideological questions and not simply questions of effectiveness. Uh, and finally, to the extent that social capital is capital, and maybe this is a thought that um, you might want to um, respond to if you have some critical ideas on this, that uh, because it's capital, it's inherently competitive in nature that social capitalism is a form of capitalism, that competition among 
building national competition, building national social capital makes nation states competitive with other nation states. Building social capital within groups makes groups competitive with other groups. And there are what non-zero sum aspects to competition, but there are also zero sum aspects to competition. Okay, so um, I think that's about it. And I'm going to then um, turn it over to you and uh, I, I welcome your thoughts and um, your, your, your views and uh, any, um, any ways that you may want to um, move me in a different direction. Uh, so. Um, no, Mary? I'm sorry. Uh -huh. Yeah. I was just actually observing a fascinating um, uh -huh. comparison to Porter's competitive advantage of nations, so etc. Uh, yeah, we have um, George. Uh, we've actually got two people that have been hanging hanging on. Uh, I apologize a bit. to them. No, 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 no. I've been talking to them in the background, um, and one of those is uh, Giorgio. Giorgio, did you want to ask your question? Followed by, uh, sorry. If, if Giorgio has popped out, then uh, Alfredo, come Alfredo, back yeah. Yes, hello everybody. Thank you for interesting lecture. I would have um, such a question. No, my question is uh, that. Uh, 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 how could we discuss a religion as a source of social capital? Uh, is it possible religious virtues like grace, charity, goodness, etc., to convert into social capital? Or are they themselves with social capital? Great question. Um, I think that a lot of social capital uh, theorists would argue that religion is an essential part of social capital. Uh, because religion is one of the institutions that brings people together. Um, Scott Feld uh, had coined the, the phrase network foci. Um, and um, I'm not sure if it's Scott's idea or if it's my um, appropriation of, 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 of Scott's idea. But, you know, I had described religious institutions as essential network foci, that is churches, um, mosques, synagogues, temples, are places that bring people together and establish relationships among themselves and, and therefore are fundamental sources of social capital. Um, and you could also see it in a normative sense that mm -hmm. religions create common, um, a common sense of cooperation and therefore enable people to work together. Um, so, you know, I would say that um, religious institutions are absolutely essential uh, in the study of social capital. Mm -hmm. did, did that kind of address your question, your thought? Uh, yes, but I I would have another question. Uh, mm -hmm. rel religion and uh, religion is uh, informal institution, and uh, how uh, is it possible religion norms to convert into formal uh, uh, formal institution like um, law or state law or, or some kind of. Um, uh, some kind of uh, these kind of norms. Uh, mm, mm -hmm. mm. Uh, yeah, I mean, here again, we might be getting at the at the question at the the problem of um, social capital is inherently ideological. Um, mm -hmm. The relationship between religion and the state is one that differs from country to country. Um, the, the 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 French idea of laicite would exclude mm -hmm. religion from a public sphere all or attempt to exclude religion from a public sphere altogether. Uh, within the United States, the idea of separation in chur of church and state, although different people would interpret it in various ways, I think 
means that people bring religious commitments and religious organizations to political activity, but that the state is not um, permitted to um, support one religious um, form of religious activity over another. Um, and, and I think actually that, that religions are, are formal institutions. I mean, religions exist as, as, um, as organizations, as, as churches, as temples, you know, and I think maybe one of the distinctions between, say, religion and spirituality you know, might be that spirituality is informal and individual in nature, that religion is inherently um, communal or collective, right? You could see that in what the word ecclesia or basangha, um, that, you know, it always describes a given community, right? Okay, thank you. Right. Yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, lots of people have been saying thank you very much, Carl, um, who haven't been able to stay on. Um, but one, there's one person that I'm aware of that's been um, hanging on a question, which is Alfredo. And uh -huh. after that, I'll hand back to Tristan and yourself to finalise things. Okay, I hope that I haven't um, uh, overextended anyone's patience. Uh, no, absolutely. <laughs> it's been a wonderful webinar because uh, you've actually incorporated people's questions into it. So it's, I, from my view, it's actually been brilliant. That's kind uh, but of you. Alfredo is, uh, has been uh, wanting to ask a question. Okay, please go ahead. Hello, um, greetings from Mexico. My question hey. is, um, how can we quantify social capital? How can we measure uh, that variable? <sighs> Another one of those wicked problems, huh? Um, yeah, um, I, I guess the answer I would give is that there is no one way of, of, uh, of quantifying. And I, I know that Tristan has, has, um, has struggled with this issue. People do try to quantify it and they do come up with measures of social capital, but there are different measures. And I don't know that one measure is necessarily um, better than another. Um, uh, you know, obviously, if you're going to use social capital in a, um, a quantitative analysis, then you have to come up with what some measure of what uh, levels of trust within a community, um, uh, network ties. So, you know, um, those might be ways in which you could attempt to quantify social capital, but those are not exhaustive. Um, Tristan, does that seem to be consistent with what you found in dealing with that wicked problem? Uh, yeah, I think that pretty much the literature tends to agree that measurement is, is based on context. And so there isn't one universal way to go about measuring social capital. And I think the literature also uh, really strongly emphasizes the need to link measurement to the conceptual understanding of what social capital is. And there's different approaches as you've highlighted. And so it's really important then to, I guess, think very carefully about the context, think very carefully about the, the nature of, of what social capital is from any given particular conceptual approach. And then to, to build a measure, there's lots of measures out there. Um, there's actually, actually no shortage of, of quantitative measures. Uh, I did a survey of about 250 articles on social capital last year, and I found that there was you know, about 125 different instruments were being used to measure social capital. So, so there's no shortage of it, of measures. Um, and it's really just a matter of being really careful and thinking through and ensuring that you, you, you know, you're, you're doing rigorous research. I think that sometimes in the social capital literature, people are quite cavalier with their choice of, of, of instruments um, and people need to pay a little more attention to, to the theory. Yeah, well, 125 measures means that uh, coming up with the right one is, can be problematic. 
Yeah, and I'm not sure there is a right one. You know, I think there's 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 a good one for any particular context, um, and that's where just you know again starting with the, the, the conceptualization and not making outlandish assumptions about the, the the link between the particular you know proxy that you're using and and the and the, the understanding of social capital you're looking at. You know, like I would suggest that uh, some people have chosen things like mobile phone ownership you know, as a proxy for bridging social capital, as the only proxy for bridging social capital. And I think that that's a, you know, perhaps a, a difficult assumption to make. Yeah, hey, thank you. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, I mean, um, Alfredo, I think that that's a great question and some of the best questions are the hardest and, and that's a really hard question. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. So, Marion, was there anything else in the chat, or can I ask a question? No, Tristan, you go for it. Um, uh, Ramat had something, but I'll yeah, I'll leave it with you, Tristan. Just wanted to get your your thoughts, Carl. Um, quite a few authors have suggested that the concept of social capital is is corrective to the shortcomings of of neoclassical economic theorizing, and I think. You know, Jim Coleman made this comment himself that he sort of saw social capital as having this kind of purpose. Um, I was sort of wondering what you thought about that, you know, whether you think that it has been effective in that way, is it used in that way? Have we really made any progress, do you think? Yeah, um, you know, I think that probably um, there is, even within, an econo even within the discipline of, of economics, um, a strong tendency to recognize that economic questions are also social questions. Um, and um, social economics is a, um, an important uh, area. And, and one, of the, one of the virtues of social capital theory might be that it provides us with a way of thinking about how economic issues, not, issues beyond economics, but, but also economic issues can't be dealt with only in terms of individual supply and individual demand uh, and um, the limitations of neoclassical theory. So yeah, I mean, I think that, um, uh, that, that Coleman is entirely right about that. And, and that, that's one of the virtues of social capital theory is that it um, provides us with an avenue for thinking about how human productivity is a matter of social relationships. Absolutely. Uh, one final thought as well. Um, there has been a lot of criticism of social capital theory, you know, particularly Ben Fine is, is, is a very vocal critic um, of social capital theory. And I think that it's, it's difficult to argue with a lot of his critique. You know, it seems to be quite valid and applies to much of the literature. Acknowledging, of course, that the literature is incredibly diverse. And so it's difficult to make any real generalizations applying to the, the entire body of literature. Um, what, what do you see as kind of the major challenges and what sort of solutions perhaps we could, like where should we be putting our effort to, to improve the rigor of social capital? Hmm. Um, well, I mean, I think one area is certainly to, to recognize the limits of social capital theory. I mean, to, to say that um, a concept is difficult to operationalize is not necessarily to say that it's invalid. Um, one of the criti major criticisms of social capital theory is that it is essentially network theory. Um, and I think the networks are a critical part of social capital, but what we're really talking about here is how do networks serve as assets and, and maybe a way to improve the rigor in social capital theory is focus on that concept of assets and in what way and how do social relationships not only bring people together, but how do they enable them to achieve productive uh, outcomes in the sense of um, realizing objectives? Was that, uh, I know that was maybe um, 
uh, an overly broad answer, but uh, maybe it sort of touched on the question you asked. I think we, we probably do need to think about these sorts of broad directions okay. that we want to focus on. Yeah. Um, I think like assets perhaps is a similar sort of word to resources, which is used a lot in, right. in different conceptions of social capital. And in the group recently, I asked the group, you know, what how they understood the word resources in the context of social capital, you know, whether they thought it was, you know, things like wealth and, and influence and power or whether these resources were actually things like, you know, norms and trust and reciprocity and belonging, which is more along the lines of, of Bob Putnam's right. conceptualization, right. or whether or not these resources actually were, you know, information and physical assets and financial capital and these more sort of tangible forms of assets. And we had quite a variety of perspectives. You know, I think most people indicated they were the norms and trust kinds of, you know, more relational assets. But certainly a lot of people thinking they were the, the more sort of tangible information and physical assets. And a few people along the lines following, you know, Nan Lin's approach where it was more the wealth and, and so forth. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I um, one of the things that that I try to do in the, in the forthcoming book is I have a, um, a causal diagram that tries to tie all of these things together. Um, I'm not going to inflict that on you right now, but you know, I sort of struggle with how do we tie together norms and values, the structural properties of groups, access to information as different dimensions of social capital. Um, and just like say socioeconomic status is a matter of the overlap of education, income, and occupational prestige, you might think about social capital, or we might think about social capital as the overlap of norms and values, um, informational resources, um, organizational and, 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 and um, institutional constraints. Um, that, it, you know, it's a, it, the answer is, I think that it, should be considered a multi-dimensional concept. And maybe that's a way toward how do you actually me measure it, is that if you can find multiple measures that are not the same thing, but that are interrelated, and if you could find um, informational res resources, um, uh, intensity of interpersonal ties, uh, organizational membership, and look at how the, all of those things overlap, um, even overlap in measurable terms, that might give us a more rigorous way to think about social capital. Yeah, absolutely. And it's that... Or that's at the top of my head kind of thought. And, and that relates to the problem of separating the source, the form, and the consequences of social capital, yeah. which, which seem right. to be so incredibly interrelated that you almost can't separate them. You know, like... Yeah, yeah, but 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 then again, one of the problems with um, society in general is that everything is recursive. <laughs> everything is recursive, and everything is interrelated, and the distinctions that we make are often conceptual in character. Absolutely, yeah. I think that's a really important point. There's a really useful metaphor that talks about. Uh, social capital as if it was an, ele an electricity system, you know. Ah, uh, ah, uh, yeah. So is yeah. is social capital the wires, you know, basically the networks, mm -hmm. or is it the actual electricity, you know, is it the assets or the resources that are mobilized, or in fact, is it the conductivity of the wire, so the environment that might, uh, you know, mitigate or allow these resources to be um, oh. mobilized within the system, and so. I think, you know, you can't, you don't have an electricity network without all three of those things. And so, right. you know, social capital seems to be quite similar. You, you need the networks right. or you need the infrastructure. You need the resources. Otherwise, what's actually being mobilized, what benefits are actually being realized. But that's more an uh -huh. outcome than what social capital really is. But you need a, yeah. you know, a conductive environment. You need an environment where these things can occur. So I think it's, it's a useful kind of metaphor to understand that complexity. Great metaphor. If I steal it, who should I uh, attribute it to? Um, originally, it was uh, Srencer and Woolcock, 2004. Oh, had, okay. Had okay. wires and electricity, um, but I've added the, the conductivity part to it. 
Uh, okay, so so I should um, uh, attribute it to you and Spencer and Wolcott. I think uh, so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's sort of uh, what I was getting at when I talked about uh, social capital is something that emerges across levels, uh, but the idea of an electrical system is maybe a metaphor that is more um, uh, immediately comprehensible. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Oh. And I, I, you know, I think the levels too, like it's, it's, it's so fundamental, so important to understand the levels, you know, the way in, in which things um, sort of develop and change within the, the context of different levels. So I, I find it very difficult to, to understand social capital without understanding it within the context of the different levels. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So was there any final comments or, or questions or comments from anybody? There's been uh, quite a lot of interest in the book uh, that you just mentioned, Carl. Uh, hopefully that's going to be available as an e-book. As you know, this morning you've been talking to people all around the world and hopefully it's coming out as an e-book as well. I, I think it is. Yeah, I, I think um, uh, that uh, you know, I was telling, Tristan knew when it was coming out, which I didn't. So, you oh, know, good. apparently he's, <laughs> he's more up on things than I am. Um, but, you know, I did look at, the thing the publisher sent me and, and there is it is coming out as an ebook which is good because i think the paper version is more than uh, i would be willing to pay for um, and also hard to access for a number of and our hard members to access. Yeah. Uh, so yeah i'll i'll send ah. uh tristan the, the the link when it comes out to 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 uh an ebook uh and also since um uh i think for many people you could spend too much money on on uh, on books. You know, if you could get your library to purchase uh, an act, purchase the the ebook, that that way you can read it without having to pay for it. Um, which no, maybe the, the publisher probably doesn't want me to say that, but uh, but yeah, I mean, um, uh, I prefer not to spend huge amounts of money myself. On, on 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 books. So yeah, I think it is coming out as as, as an ebook, okay. and uh, I appreciate any readers I get. Um, I would also say that I don't know if everyone was here earlier, but uh, I apologized for um, not being able to wit be with you the first time this was scheduled. We had a natural disaster that intervened here. Um, one of the reasons that you know, I mentioned earlier that I thought investment in petrochemicals is a bad idea. Um, or did a, a positive, not not a positive outcome of, of financial capital. Um, we're having more and more natural disasters, and we had one that intervened that kept me from the first scheduled date. So I apologize for that, and I appreciate everyone's willingness to come back for this. Oh, thank you, Carl. Thank and you. I think I think we'll wrap up now and. Um... The next webinar is next week, which is going to be Professor Jules Pretty, who's going to be talking about social capital and the ills of affluence, which I think will be a fascinating uh, webinar. Jules Pretty has been publishing on social capital since around about 2001. Uh, he's in the environment and sustainability space, and he's got some you know, really interesting perspectives on social capital. So I hope everyone can join us for that one next week. Um, that's really it. Thanks very much, Carl. Um, we really appreciate your all of everything you've done, putting all of the effort into preparing this and, and presenting and answering everybody's questions. Uh, well, so thank you. I, I, there were great questions and some of them made me think about things that I have not thought about adequately before. Uh, so uh, it, was, it was a really good event. So thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, so I'll just end the recording and live stream uh, and then we can have any informal questions if anybody has any.